As we discovered in the previous presentation concerning adjusting entries for deferred revenue and expense items, adjusting entries are made in order to adjust the account balances at the end of the period and correct them. The adjusting entries are made at the end of the accounting period before the financial statements are prepared and they are necessary because some of the events that did change the accounts were not recorded during the period. This happened simply because it wasn't convenient or feasible to do so. And now, at the end of the period, we must make these entries. If we don't, the account balances and the financial statements will not be correct. The adjusted trial balance that is displayed on this slide is the one that we left our company with at the end of the previous presentation. The accounts that are highlighted in green are the accounts that were adjusted in that presentation. Those in yellow are the accounts that we will adjust in this presentation. In the process of making adjustments for the accrued revenue and expense items, we will also be adding a few new accounts with balances to this trial balance. In the previous presentation, we examined adjusting entries for deferrals. Adjusting entries for accruals are a different type of adjustment. As we know, accrual basis accounting rules require that revenues be recorded when they have been earned and that expenses be recorded when they have been incurred, whether they have been paid or not. In the case of deferrals, cash is paid for things such as supplies or equipment first, and then the expenses incurred later when these assets are used up. It's the opposite with accruals. In the case of accruals, the expense is incurred first before the cash is paid. Wages, for example, or telephone bills, behave this way. They are paid after the expense is incurred. That is, after the employees have worked for us or after we have used the utility service. We must be careful to be sure to record these kinds of expenses if they have been incurred and it's easy to omit them. After all, the December telephone bill won't even be received until January and the wages won't even be calculated from the payroll time tickets until payday arrives. But accrual basis accounting rules would require us to estimate or to calculate the amount of the expense that has been incurred and record it in the current period. This will require an adjusting entry. Terminology. When something accrues, it accumulates. An accrued expense, then, is one that has accumulated and will be paid, but not until the payment due date. Since the expense has been incurred, the company is legally obligated to make the payment. All adjusting entries for accrued expenses require a debit to an expense account to record the expense and a credit to a liability account to record the obligation to make that future payment. In the last frame, in the illustration at the bottom of the screen in the blue box, accounts payable was used in the illustration for the accrued liability account. Typically, when making adjusting entries for accruals, separate liability accounts with different titles are used for these accrued expenses. Accounts payable is reserved for the amounts that are owed to the company's suppliers, that is, the companies that our company bought its equipment from, or its supplies from, or its inventory from. If our company, for example, estimates that $150 of utilities expense has accrued by the end of December, then the adjusting entry to record this expense would be de debit utilities expense $150 and then instead of crediting accounts payable, credit a liability account called utilities payable for $150. If our company estimates that $100 of wages expense has been incurred by December 31st, then instead of crediting accounts payable, the credit would go to wages payable, a different liability account, for the $100 
and the debit would go to wages expense for $100. Note the effect of this adjusting entry in the following period. When the payment due date is finally reached in January, let's say, the accounts will be paid. Note that the cash paid may be greater than the liability account balance if additional expense was incurred in the following period. For example, suppose the utility bill is $150 and it is paid on January 10th. No additional expense has been incurred because we're merely paying the December utility bill. This entry would involve a debit to utilities payable to reduce our liability with a credit to cash for the $150. But suppose that the wages also paid on January 10th amount to $500. The additional $400 would represent the wages that had been earned from January 1st until January 10th. $100 of the wages were earned during December. In this case, the credit to cash is for $500, and we would need to debit wages payable for the $100 balance that we set up in the account back on December 31st. The additional $400 represents expense that's been incurred during the month of January and needs to be recorded in January. Therefore, we would have a debit to wages expense for $400 along with the debit to wages payable for $100 and then a credit to cash for the entire amount paid, $500. In addition to adjusting for accrued expense, we must also make adjusting entries to record accrued revenues. Revenues accrue if work is being done for a customer who will pay later after the job is finished. At the end of the period, it will be necessary to determine how much revenue has been earned and then to record it. All adjusting entries for accrued revenue require a debit to accounts receivable and a credit to the revenue account. Accounts receivable represents the claims we have against our customers for work that we have done for them. Here's an example. Suppose our company has begun providing services for a customer who will pay later once the job is finished. By December 31st, we determine that $300 worth of services have been performed for the customer. The job will be finished sometime in January and at that time the customer will be billed and will pay us $500 for the work we have performed. As of December 31st, 300 of this 500 has been earned. So our adjusting entry to record the accrued revenue is debit accounts receivable for $300 to record our claim against the customer and then credit the revenue account for the $300 that has been earned as of December 31st. Let's consider the effect of this adjusting entry on the entry that will be made in the following period when the customer does pay us. At that time, the customer will pay us the entire $500 it will be necessary to debit cash at that time. The account receivable balance that was established on December 31st is for only $300, and that is the portion of the total amount that had been earned as of that time. The additional $200 represents revenue that was earned during January. Therefore, our entry to record the collection of cash from the customer involves a debit to the cash account for $500, a credit to accounts receivable for the $300 balance that the customer owed us as of December 31st, and then a credit to the revenue account for the additional $200 that was earned in January. Note that the $200 will appear on the January income statement. The $300 has already been shown as part of the revenues as of December 31st of the previous period. On this slide, 
we have the original trial balance that we started with at the beginning of this presentation shown on the left side. On the right side is our current adjusted trial balance after the adjustments for accrued revenues and accrued expenses have been recorded. As you can see, many accounts have changed balances as a result of making these adjusting entries. Once again, we see that many of the account balances change as a result of the adjusting entries we have made for accrued revenues and expenses. It is important, therefore, that we make them and that we make them correctly. If we do not, then the information reported in the financial statements will be incorrect. The table on this slide summarizes the effects of a failure to make the adjusting entries that were illustrated in this presentation. In our first adjusting entry for accrued utilities, had this entry not been made, then revenues would not have been affected, but the utilities expense would not have been recorded and expenses on the income statement would have been understated. This would result in an overstatement of net income. On the balance sheet, assets would not be affected, but if we did not record the utilities payable, liabilities would be understated. And if net income is overstated on the income statement, the ending capital account balance will also be overstated. The same is true for our adjusting entry for accrued wages. If the wages expense was not recorded, then revenues would not be affected on the income statement, but the expenses would be understated and net income would be overstated. The assets on the balance sheet would not be affected, but if we did not record the wages payable, the liabilities would be understated, and then since net income was overstated, the ending capital account balance would be overstated. In the last adjusting entry we did for accrued revenues, if the revenue was not recorded, revenues on the income statement would be understated, expenses would not be affected, but net income would then be understated. And on the balance sheet, if we did not record the account receivable we have with our customer, assets would be understated, the liabilities would not be affected, but because net income was understated, the ending owner equity, the capital account balance, would be understated.